Oh, and a pleasant good afternoon to everyone out there in Irish Breakdown land. I'm Vince Daddario. I'm the football analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. With me, as always, is that guy right there. That's Brian Driscoll. He's the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. And uh, we're going to talk a little offensive line today, specifically Harry Heastand returning to the offensive line and why, obviously, it's huge that he's coming back. I mean, his reputation clearly speaks for itself, his track record, etc. But... I think the timing of this whole thing really just couldn't work out better with him coming in. You've got eight guys with at least two starts under their belt. And then you've got a depth chart with a lot of young talent. A lot of guys are going to be freshmen, sophomores, and they got a lot of football ahead of them. So it just feels like it's a good place, a good timing. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of the premise of the show today is it's obviously important that there's an upgrade on offensive line. I mean, that's something we've been talking about for years at Irish Breakdown. And with all due respect to Coach Quinn, he did the best he could. He tried sure. hard. I've never questioned his character, his work ethic. I just never. questioned his results. Right. An ability to really lead a, an elite offensive line. There are so many different reasons why I think the timing of this couldn't be better. And, you know, we, we've seen – we're entering a phase – this more big picture first, Vince. Yeah. We're entering a phase where – Notre Dame was fortunate, let's be honest. The last four or five, four years, 2017, challenging schedule. 18 to 21, not really so much, especially Especially the last two years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you had Clemson and outside of Clemson last year and Cincinnati this year. I mean, you know, what what's Notre Dame hanging its schedule on? Right. An eight and four North Carolina team. Well, and going into right. last year, it was like, okay, you know, we talked about tough stretches and, you know, some different areas where the schedule could have been really difficult. It just, just didn't turn out that way. Well, I mean, and then when they lost the original schedule that was supposed to have Arkansas, it was supposed oh, to have Wisconsin, sure. it was supposed to have Clemson. In, yeah. You know, and, and, and you replaced the, some of those teams with what they replaced them with. And, you know, I mean, you had you had Clemson that was really good, but you beat them in overtime without Trevor Lawrence, without Tyler Davis, without James Skalski, without Mike Jones. Right. Then you play an eight and four North Carolina team. Your next two big wins are over what six and five North Carolina and Pitt. Yeah. And after that, everybody had a losing record. You know, this year same kind of thing. You know, we're, we're talking about how we felt Notre Dame was one of the four best teams in the country from a talent standpoint. But the, the the problem that we had as far as pushing for them to be in the playoff was, what's the resume built around? Sure, a win over a seven and five Wisconsin team, or an eight and four Wisconsin team, or or an eight and four Purdue team. I mean, that's what you're. And Notre Dame literally didn't beat a ranked team this year, as far right. as and we were was ranked at the end of the year. And remember, going into the final rankings, we're like, man, if if this 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 and happens, then, right. then Purdue might get ranked. Like th- those are the conversations right. that we were having to build your resume, right? Around, right? right. And so you 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 you're now looking fast forward a little bit, and let's look at the two thousand the two thousand twenty two and the two thousand twenty three schedules. That's and animal. you know and twenty four. So I mean, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. Things are going to amp up a little bit for Notre Dame now. Number one, the biggest thing is USC just hired Lane, you know, rank Lincoln Riley. Now, I think Lincoln Riley has a lot to prove. Uh, you know, Lincoln Riley inherited a playoff team at Oklahoma. I mean, Bob Stoops left him with a team that had already been to the college yeah. ball oh. playoff when he left, right? He walked into a great situation. Right. Not and, a rebuild at a all. Job, you know, continuing it and all those type of things. But it wasn't like he walked into a situation where – you know they they were they were this not good football team right he walked right. into a pretty good situation there and and he's back that helps their situation obviously you look at other things that factor into it you know this year you play at ohio state you play clemson you play a byu team on a neutral field that you know that's been pretty good the last this past two seasons sure. You know, Boston College should be better this upcoming season. So the schedule like at North Carolina, so the schedule ramps up a little bit, right? And then you look at 2023, and it doesn't get easier. You know, you play Ohio State and USC, or, you know, by October 14th, you play both of those at home. You have another road game against Clemson. You have NC State and Louisville coming up as road games in a couple of years. You're going to have Pitt at home. You know, who knows what Stanford's going to do. And then you look at the 2024 schedule. I think that's when Texas A&M jumps on. Yeah, at Texas A&M, yeah. at Purdue, uh, you've got Florida State on the schedule. At USC, you got Miami that just hired Mario Cristobal 
is going to be back on the schedule in 2014, a home game for Notre Dame. So when you look at the schedule, I think that I mentioned Florida State is going to be on that schedule as well. So when you look at the schedule, it what we think is that it's going to tick up a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Quite a bit, actually, I think, unless yeah. some teams kind of fall back down. And, you know, I don't think Clemson's descent is permanent. I think they're going to send back up. I don't think they're ever going to be what they were from 16 to 18. I think that was a stretch that was unique. Yeah. Uh, because but I think they'll of, be solid. I mean, I don't, gonna, well, I'd say yeah. they're going to be better than solid. They're going to be the well, best yeah. team in the ACC. They're going to be a perennial yeah. top 10 team. They're just right. not going to be right. that team every single year that Bama worries about, right? I don't think they're going to be quite that again, but they're still going to be really good. You know, Texas A&M just signed the number one recruiting class in the country. By the time Notre Dame has to go out there, those guys will be juniors, right? And so the schedule upticks, and you can't get away with just out-talenting 10, 11 opponents a year like Notre Dame has done the last several years. You're going to have to outplay and outcoach people. It's going to look a lot more like the 2017 season when Notre Dame played seven ranked teams, right? and they went four and three against those ranked teams. You know, they, they lost some games they shouldn't have, won some impressive sure. games. Sure, but <coughs> sorry, still coming back from this. They lost some games that year that you know they probably should have won. But when you play more good teams week after week after week, like Notre Dame did in 2017, then you're you're going to have a situation where um, you have to bring it more. You can't you can't play like for example. If Notre Dame's line would have played the first half of the 2017 season like it played the first half of the 2021 season, they lose to Georgia. They lose to Michigan State for sure. Right. You know, they don't beat USC like they did because that game was 100% fueled by a dominant offensive line performance. No question. You know, and you look at the NC State yep. game, that would have been a lot more of a challenging game. You know, Boston College was a close game in the first half until the offensive line took that game over. There's a lot of games you look at and say, I don't know if Notre Dame wins that game if you have line play like you had in 2021. You were able to get away with that last year and in 2020, because well, 2020 the line played better, but you were able to get away with it last year because your the schedule stunk. Especially the second half. I mean, well, I think was... getting Harry Heastan back at a time when the schedule is toughening up is important. Number two. I think that you're you're entering a phase in Tommy Reese's career that he's going to start either showing us that we're correct in thinking he's got a chance to be a really really good offensive coordinator. You're 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 putting like one of the concerns I have is that coach Reese seems to be a guy that that thinks he has all the answers. And he's only going to listen to a select number of people, which sure. is not a criticism to be completely honest with you because I've been there as you know, and and when you think you're smarter than everybody else in the room, and sometimes you are, you're only going to listen to a certain number of people, right? And I don't think that this is just my opinion. This isn't me sharing intel, but just things that I've heard and just you know, just trying to read the room a little bit. I don't think he I think he liked Jeff Quinn as a as a man. Everyone did. Everyone did. But I don't think he was someone that he was going to every day saying, Hey, what should we do here? Right. I think Coach Reese understood that, you know, I'm kind of playing with my hand tied behind my back a little bit here. Sure. Yeah. Right. I think it's important that he gets someone better. But I think Harry Heastan is someone that Tommy Reese respects. From what I'm told, this is the move, this is the direction that Tommy wanted to go with because he played under and coached under Harry Heastan. And I think that Harry Heastan's the kind of person that when he has an idea, you're going to listen. And if you don't want to listen, <laughs> it's going to make you listen. Right, exactly. You know, and, Or he's not going to be there much longer. I mean, right. it, it, he just demands that kind of respect and that he deserves it. I mean, his track right. record shows that he deserves it, right? Right. Yeah. And so I think that's important too. So here, so so Tommy's entering that, you know, this is now going to be his third year as, an, as a coordinator. He's kind of hitting that st stretch where if he's as good as we think he is, he should really take off. But I don't care how good of an offensive coordinator you are. If you don't have really good O-line play, you're going to be limited. So now that he enters that phase, bring in Harry Heastan, and all of a sudden, okay, now you can't use, well, the line The line wasn't what we hoped it would be. The line didn't do its job kind of right. thing. That's right. not going to be an excuse anymore. And I think that's good for Coach Reese. So that's another kind of big picture reason. I think number three, I think the defense is getting to the point where 
we saw this year and it, it, the issue I feel and just talking to some people that some of the issues that the team had on defense weren't exposed until they got to games. And because they just the offense couldn't hurt them with it or or didn't have the ability to do certain things to get to, to create problems. And it wasn't until Saturdays that that happened. When in 2017, 2015, I guarantee you, the defense knew exactly what its issues were because they were exposed by that offense. I uh, CJ Prosice was on the Lucky Lefty podcast yesterday with uh, right. with Malik and Sean, and he talked about that. He was like, you know, in 2015, you know, we we like had a we were really explosive offense, so sometimes we wondered like, are we supposed to be making this many big plays in practice? <laughs> You know what I mean? So the problems that that defense was going to have in games manifested in practice. I think that having an offensive line that's coached by Harry Heastan is going to do wonders for Al Washington's defensive line and, Mar- and and whoever Marcus Freeman hires as the defensive coordinator moving forward. Mike Elko talked about this a lot. Their truth – what did he call them? Truth detect- – lie detectors? Yeah, right. Isn't that what he called the offensive line? He called yep. them lie detectors? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're going to expose the truth. Exactly. Right? And they're going to make you better. And I think as you enter this stretch of big games and tough schedules, you need to have all of that as part of what you're doing. And so that's the first set of reasons, Vince. And then, of course, the second part is just the players that they're going to have coming back. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And I, I think – I think the defensive one is very interesting because the the bar has been set very high on the defensive line as far as recruiting and and I'm going I'm you know up to this point with Mike Elson with coaching and and I I have full faith that that Al Washington will continue that trend right and you know it, it's like those old Lou Holtz days where practices were harder than the games well yeah. that's what I want to see in the trenches right you know what I mean I want to see those guys beating each other and right. and making each other better every day in practice so that when they get up in the game, it's like <laughs> we compete against guys that are better than this at practice every day. You know what I mean? Like that makes your team better and mm-hmm. that raises the standard big time. And, and I think you're going to see some epic battles at practice between Al Washington's crew and Harry Heastan's crew. I, and I, and I that makes you fun. better as a team. Yeah. And that's the important. No thing. question. No question. I think the timing of it from a player personnel standpoint is also very, very important. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we brought this up the other day. It was something that we talked about during the offseason, which was this was a big year for Jeff Quinn in that he was going to be coaching sort of his players for the first time. Right. And what I meant by that was in 2018, Jarrett Patterson, or no, Jarrett Patterson was in the center in 2018. In 2018, the entire starting lineup was was Harry Heastan's recruits and guys he coached. Right. 2019, it was four of them, and then Jarrett Patterson. Yep. 2020, it was four of them and Jarrett Patterson. So Jarrett Patterson was kind of lifted up by being surrounded by Harry Heastan guys. He was learning lessons from guys that learned their lessons from right. Harry Heastan. Right, right, right. Well, this was the first year that we were going to see a bunch of Jeff Quinn guys. And Josh Lug was the only guy that had been coached or recruited by Harry Heastan or been coached by Harry Heastan or recruited like as the full, the full right. deal. Right. And we saw a line that just didn't know how to play physical, didn't know how to play with good technique, all those different things. And it was obviously a problem. And so now you look at it and say, okay, well, moving forward, how deep do you want to go into that? How deep do you want to go into Jeff Quinn being the only voice that those guys hear? And the only foundation that, 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 you know, that, that you're building on that on his foundation for multiple years with him. I think when I look at the freshman, for example, Joe Walt being so successful. Well, Joe Walt was not an early enrollee. He was that rare freshman lineman that played as a freshman without having the whole offseason on campus. And so, you know, he came in as a really fundamentally sound player because of his dad and, and all those type of things, who was an NFL lineman and played offensive line at Iowa all, for a long time. Right. And and he remade his body in the offseason. Right. Too. Right. But my point is more so does he lose some of that technical savviness the longer he stays in the Jeff Quinn era? You know, how long does till, till you know does Blake Fisher kind of develop in that system? All those things matter because you know the first couple classes for Jeff Quinn were a little hit or miss numbers wise, and then you know, 2020 one starts to kind of fix that with the high level players at the top with Blake and Rocco. Then you get a, a project that you and I liked that we thought he was a project 
and Joe Alt, but a guy that I gave a four and a half star upside grade to, which is a top 50 national player. You know, and then, you know, solid player like Caleb Johnson. And then, of course, 2022, you know, you get a really good four man class before Quinn leaves. And then Tommy Reese is able to go out and get Billy Shrouth to kind of finish that class off, even though it was known by then that Jeff Quinn wasn't coming back. You've kind of salvaged the roster a little bit with recruiting. And Jeff and Jeff Quinn deserves some credit for that. Sure. That he was able to bring in those guys. But it's like, okay, but who's going to teach those guys how to play? And the longer this carries on, the the harder the the the, the reclamation project was going to be for Harry Heastan. So, sure. you know, you look at it now and you can say, arguably, your four or five just most God-given talented players are going to be guys that spent no more than a semester or two semesters under Jeff Quinn or didn't weren't coached by Jeff Quinn at all when you look at you know, the incoming freshman class, Billy Shroud, Joey Tonona, Emil Wagner, Ty Chan, and Ashton Craig. And I think that that matters. Yeah. You know, you go another year of this, and all of a sudden it's like just more of those bad habits, or not even bad habits, but just not being taught the important, the really important things becomes more and more prominent. And, and I think that's another reason why I think the timing of this is so important for Harry Heastan's return. Like if you do this a year from now, you know, I don't know if that impact is the same where now you're going to go into the 2023 season with Clemson on the road and Ohio state at home and year two of Lincoln Riley and all those type of things with a much, you're now going to be in year two of Harry Heastan. Right. And, and you know, then you go into 2024 with Texas A&M and Miami and you're going to be in year three of Harry Heastan. And so I think those things are important. And, and I think those things, and I think that Notre Dame has skill talent, the potential skill talent the next couple of years to be as good as they've had in the last decade. I believe that like top to bottom and the thing holding them back, we felt in a lot of instances was the offensive play, the offensive line. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm doing some research now and I'm studying the number of 20 plus yard runs between 15 to 17 and then 18 to 21. I want to see, cause I just felt like they just didn't have as many holes for the backs to get through. And you, and even some of the big runs we saw this year were plays where they had to make dudes miss behind the line of scrimmage. You know, like the 90 something yard run, like here's a, like Kyron Williams. What was it? A 93 yard touchdown run was a 91 yard touchdown. I think it was run. 91, 91 with the big stiff arm. Same, and everything. same yeah. length as CJ Procise against Georgia tech in 2015. Two completely different runs. Oh, yeah. On one, the guy has to make somebody, two people miss in the backfield, has to cut back against the grain, has to stiff arm a guy several yards behind the line of scrimmage, and then he goes. That's not an offensive line thing. CJ's in 2015 against Georgia Tech is a counter play where nobody touches him. You think of the 80-yard run that Josh Adams had against USC. Nobody touches him. Like, when was the last time? Downhill. Right. When was the last time Chris Tyree had a hole to run through where nobody touched him? It was in 2020 against Syracuse, and he went for 80-plus yards, right? He didn't have those holes. Kyron didn't have those holes. That's why it was so right. important to have Kyron because, because he Kyron can make could stuff make happen. things yeah, happen. Exactly. You know? That's why he was so valuable. That's not Chris's year. game. Chris's right. game is one cut and go. Hit that right. hole. You know, he is, a, he is an explosive guy. In order to maximize Chris Tyree's skill set, you need a guy, you need a line that can do what Harry Heastan's lines did in 15. Sure. And even in 16 and 17. I mean, I, even the, the 16 game where they were completely outmanned against USC, the reason they stayed in that game in the first half is because they were running on USC. I mean, first play of the game, Josh Adams goes for 75 yards. You know, and, and so those are the things you look at and say, if they could take the line play from 15 and 17 and put it with, the skill talent that they've recruited the last, you know, three, four years, boy, that could be impressive. Well, now we get a chance to actually see that. And I think that to me is what makes it important. And then of course, it's going to be up to coach Heastan to continue to recruit and add on to that. But you think about Harry Heastan's guaranteed at least two years with Blake Fisher and Joe Walton. Yeah. Has to. He gets before. Jarrett Patterson for a year, right? You know, and he's going to get a chance to, you know, some of the kids, like some of the kids on the roster are guys he recruited but never coached. You know, he he clearly saw something in Zeke Carell and sure. Andrew Kristoffic 
because he recruited them. He offered them before he left, if you remember correctly. Sure, yeah. So clearly he saw something in those guys he liked. Now you feel like, okay, if Zeke Carell is a guy that we think can play, well, now we're going to find out if he is or isn't. We're going to find that out about Andrew Christophic. And so that, to me, is the exciting. And Josh Lug, too, is another one. Like, Josh has to stay healthy, but I feel like Josh never had a coach. In the, like, it's not a coincidence that the further along Josh got in his career, the worse he got. Yeah, he really did. Technically and yeah. fundamentally and all yeah. those type of ways. Well, I have a theory on that, and that's going to be proven true or false to a degree this season. And my theory is the further he got away from Harry's teaching, the worse he got. Because Josh need Josh is – and one thing we've said about him, Josh is one of those kids that needs a little bit of a kick in the butt. Mm-hmm. And I think Josh knows he needs a kick in the butt. That's just the kind of kid he is, right? And that's not a negative. It's just some guys need to be pushed. Sure, sure. And Josh needs to be pushed. Yep. And he, but he wasn't getting that push the way it was needed. And I'm not talking about push like yelling at him. I'm talking about pushing as far as how you're coaching him and making sure that you're really staying on him and giving him the tools to. I mean, he wasn't that ready-made offensive lineman like, like Robert Hainsey was, and to a degree, like Liam Eikenberg was. He was kind of a raw kid that came from a system where they threw the ball like two, three times a game. Right. And he needed that work and needed that coaching. Well, now he's going to get that for a year. So do we see the Josh Lug we thought we were going to get when he was coming out of high school or in 2019 when he's a pretty good player, when he replaced Robert Hainsey and played pretty darn good football down the stretch? Are we going to see that guy or are we going to see the guy that struggled the last two years for the most part? I think for me and Josh, I, I love Josh Lug. And I, I've made that very clear as a kid and, and as a player and all that. And I, I've been high on Josh for the last few years. Um, what worries me about this year, and I, I don't want to dive too deep into this, but it's, it's just from the injuries, right, and and staying healthy and all of that. I, I think Harry can be instrumental in getting him back to where he needs to be from a fundamental standpoint. I do. I, I absolutely believe that. I'm just worried he's had so many injuries up to this point. It has it been too many? You know, you know what I mean. Has it has it gotten to the point where his injury history is going to prevent him from being the guy that we hope he can be? Well, I think it might prevent him from being the guy he was coming out of high school. I don't think it's going to prevent him from being a pretty good football player because the issues that he had this year, Vince, for the most part, were technical. We talked all about that horrible pass set that he had, which he just lost all his power, all his base, and guys were able to get up under his chest, and it happened every single time he got beat. Yep. You know, and and so – Power rushes. Yeah. Yeah. And it it wasn't a lack of talent. It wasn't like, a oh, he's trying hard. It wasn't like what happened with Tommy Kramer last year where Tommy was giving you everything he had, but he just was playing through so many injuries. Well, you know, Tommy Kramer's healthy now, and he's starting in the NFL. Undrafted free agent starting in the NFL. True. You know, and and you, you look at that and say, look, that's the kind of thing for me with Josh Lug is maybe Josh isn't going to be an elite player, but I, I think that he's got a chance to be a, a better, more consistent player than what we had, than what we saw the last couple years from him. That's what I think. Because there were times, there were stretches this year where Josh Lug played good football. Right. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's kind of where it is. So, you know, when you look at it, I think, and then, you know, somebody somebody just said, uh, asked a question, Bobby S, is Chris Watt coming back and in what role? We talked about this the other day, too, is he is coming back. He is going to be... Uh, probably an analyst at this point in time, which means he's gonna he's not gonna be he's gonna be on the field, but he can't coach on the field. Right. He can coach in the film room and those kind of things. And I think that's gonna be an important thing. And I think that's another piece of this is I don't know if the GA from last year is gonna be back, but I heard some good things about him as a, a young up and coming coach. If he is still back, you're gonna have him, he's gonna learn a ton from here. And if he's smart, he's gonna want to stay and learn from Harry Heastan. And if he's back, and he was out on the road recently yeah. visiting recruits, so I imagine he's planning on coming back. If what I heard about him is true, that's going to be a really good resource for Harry Heastan. And he has Chris Watt as right. an analyst. It's not just Harry. It's I think it's Trevor Mendelson, I think is his name. Is that Yeah, is that, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that uh, sounds is right. Is the GA. I've heard some really good things yeah. about him as a young coach. Love I saw we him, talked about I mean, Chris Watt. Look, he coached – he was coaching – they were doing some half-line stuff uh, at the one practice we were allowed to see 
uh, prior to the Fiesta Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And while my focus was a lot on Marcus Freeman, I did watch him a little bit because they were on opposite sides of the field, right? They were on like hash and hash, essentially, and he was Mm -hmm. coaching one half and Quinn was coaching the other half. And he's a very vocal guy. Like, he was coaching them up. And I – excuse me, I was actually pretty impressed by him. Yeah, and so now you let him learn under someone like Harry Heastan, and he's going to get better. But that's a great resource for Harry Heastan because I'll say this – and you saw this in practice events. Harry Heastan always did a really good job of, of of giving his GAs a role. Yes. And utilizing them to help coach the entire line. That was something that was very important to Coach Heastan was, I can't just coach the starters. Right. I got to coach everybody. <clears throat> that's so Because when the starters leave, somebody's going to have to step into that role, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and so that's, to me, a very important piece to this. And so just another thing to look into this and talk about, like, why – why is this so important? Why is the timing of it so important? Um, what what kind of impact could this have? And, and the way I look sure, at it is sure. this. Notre Dame went out in the Fiesta Bowl and scored 35 points, had 600 yards of offense against uh, – passed for 500 yards against one of the best defenses in college football and did it with zero run game. Zero run game. Right. What happens when the run game starts getting there and you can at least be, you know, we're battling in the run game, right? You're at least battling in the run game. When that happens, you know, I start wondering about, man, this offense could take off. And that's kind of what we get to when we talk about the Tom, Tommy Reese effect is the timing of Harry Heastan returning is big for for Tommy as well. And and so those are just the things and it's it's needed because this this schedule does not continue the way it has exactly the softness of the schedule you know, does not continue i mean you said it's gonna it's gonna tick up i mean i think that's a yeah. nice way of putting it think I, about I, this yes yeah. think about this in the last three years notre dame has gone 11 and 2 10 and 2 and 11 and 2 and they've beaten a grand total of three ranked opponents at the end of the year yeah not top 10 navy ranked in 2019 clemson last year North Carolina last year, an eight and four North Carolina team. Uh, th- those are, those are to me that like 2018, they beat three in the regular season. In 2017, they beat four ranked teams. And that's what I said. Brandon Wimbush won as many games against top 25 opponents in 15 starts as Ian Book won in whatever. And I'm not blaming Ian Book for that. You can't beat ranked teams if you don't play them. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. And mm-hmm. and you know, obviously they lost. They I think they went five and five against ranked opponents. Um, you know, um, that's not going to be the case moving forward. Exactly. You're going to play more ranked teams. Yep. Yep. And Rumbers one of the things the about yeah. yeah, and one of the things about Notre Dame's schedule going down, it had tied a lot into Stanford and USC. Both went down at the same time. Because those used to be two quality teams to have on your yeah. schedule. I mean, sixteen and seventeen, yeah. they were arguably you know your your best and second best opponent in those two years. They right. were the best opponent you faced in twenty sixteen. They were the second best opponent you faced in twenty seventeen behind Georgia. Right. Right. Well, in the last you know since then they've been you know a hot mess. Well, that's that's not going to be the case anymore. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna. We've got a couple super chats here. We're, we're, we're going to try to get a guest on here soon. And I hope to be able to continue this Harry Heastan conversation with him. Garrett Nutson says, in the past, has Harry Heastan been that type of guy that takes younger coaches under his wing? Or is he the type to focus on his sex and responsibility, just wondering who Tommy Reese's mentors are? I can only speak to this for a year. I, 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 he didn't really have any young coaches. What I know is this. Chip Long is a, is a lot like Tommy Reese. Chip Long thinks he's the smartest guy in the room all the time. And I think a lot of times, you know, because he is smart, he has had success. I'm not saying that as an insult. I mean, I guarantee you that's a criticism people have made of me in the past. He always thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Uh, Chip Long loved Harry and listened to Harry a lot because Harry is an incredibly well respected coach. I mean, I've said this about the videos I was watching this past offseason of all these offensive line coaches, NFL coaches, you know, D1 Power 5 coaches, and Harry Heastan's name just randomly gets brought up like five or six times. 
Jeff Quinn spoke at this thing. Nobody brought up Jeff Quinn. Everybody talked about Harry Heastan. And there's a reason for that. He's a very well-respected offensive line coach. He's also not someone that just walks in the room and starts telling you all these different things. He's going to work within the framework of the offense. So I do think that this is a great question. Uh, I do think he's never worked with a 29-year-old offensive coordinator, but Chip Long was like 34. So right, it's not he like wasn't it's an huge, old man. Yeah, And it was right. Chip's first year or second year as a coordinator. It was it. So he was also a young play caller. And Harry Heastan did take him under his wing, and Chip allowed himself to be taken. I don't know if Tommy Reese will be allow, will allow Harry to take him under his wing. I don't think that's necessarily what Tommy Reese needs. What I think Tommy Reese needs isn't a, a mentor. I think Tommy Reese needs an offensive line coach that he trusts yes, and listens to. Absolutely. And I think that's more important because Tommy Reese's mentor his whole life has been his dad. I mean, his dad was a coach. His dad coached sure. was a recruiter under Terry Donahue. He grew up in a football right. home. He and he's an analyst on the staff. So, I mean, he's right, right there. Yeah. What he needs is not a mentor as much as he needs someone that he trusts, right. that will do what he asks him to do, that will challenge Tommy about certain things, that Tommy will listen to when challenged. Exactly. Yep. That's what he needs more than a mentor. Um, I, but the spirit of your question, I really like, and I, and, and I, I think it was, it's a, you know, I, I think it's one that, that makes a lot of sense. John a one says, what can Tosh Baker do to impress Harry? He does Harry, he have the toughest task of the position coaches. I don't think he has the toughest task. I, I, I think that, I think that, uh, I would argue that, that Mike Mickens and Chancey Stuckey have the toughest tasks simply because of inexperience for Mike Mickens finding some guys that can play sure. for Chancey yeah. Stucky. It's just starting from scratch. I mean, it's you know, a blank and, slate, and you, you're, you're going to be missing half your depth yeah. chart in the spring. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, thing. I mean, you're yeah. not going to have Avery Davis. You're not going to have Joe Wilkins. You're, you, you know, it's, it's, I think those are, I don't think Harry Heastan has a tough task. It's an important one. Right. Exactly. And he has a talented offensive line. I'll, I'll say this, the talent he's inheriting top to bottom is better now than when he walked in the door in 2012. I mean, I love Zach Martin, but if we're just going to look at what they were as redshirt freshmen and freshmen, I would argue that that, you know, the, the talent that he's inheriting now top to bottom is better than it was in 2012. And this yeah. is no do, disrespect to Braxton Cave or Mike Golick Jr. or Christian Lombard, but I mean, there's there's guys that are going to be backups on this offensive line that would start on half of Harry Heastan's early offensive lines, you know, that are just going to have a hard time seeing the field now. So I don't think his task is tough. I think his task is very important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key. That's the key. So, and then we're going to try to get the video feed here going for our guest. We're not, we don't have that just yet. So once we do, we're going to get him on and get him nope. rocking and rolling. So um, are you ready to roll down there? <laughs> All right. We got a thumbs up. So, I'm we are. Take, I'm taking a back seat, and then yeah, uh, get those questions going. So, I want to welcome to the show former Notre Dame offensive lineman, current Chicago Bear offensive lineman, Alex Bars is joining the show. Alex, thanks for being with us, man. Thanks, Brian. Man, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, hey, Alex, I want to. I want to first before we dive into the to what we we want to talk about. I just want to kind of give you a chance to kind of update you and have you update everybody on. You know, kind of what's going on with your career. You just finished what year two with the Bears, correct? Year three. Year, year three. three. Okay. Yeah, I just finished uh, year three with the Bears. Uh, first year rookie year. Uh, didn't get a ton of PT. Was active roster. Uh, played a little bit of uh, garbage time at the end of some games. Uh, second year, fortunate enough to play uh, about half the season, eight starts, and then a playoff uh, playoff game, like fifty three percent of snaps there. Uh, really get in the NFL and and get my feet wet and. Uh, play some games and understand uh, really what it takes to be out there and play at the next level. Um, and I just finished up year three, um, where that year was mainly spent. I backed up the interior three at uh, guard, center, both both guards and center. Um, and I played a little bit of tackle. I played right tackle against the Bucks um, for like the second two thirds of a game. Uh, the guy that was in there was, was struggling a little bit, so I had to play right tackle which I played in college. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to, to slide out there and play that for a game. I'm going to tell you, Alex, I think the thing holding you back in the NFL right now, if I'm going to offer my critique, is the jersey number. 64 <laughs> is just not the look, man. we got to get you a hey, seven back on the front of that jersey. I know, man. I know. What's going on with I, that? Hey, I uh, we got was given 62 <laughs> when I got there, then given 64 and just ran with it. 
Uh, I mean, being undrafted, you don't have much leeway <laughs> with choosing. Like, give me whatever number you want, as long as as long as you're still giving me that spot and giving me those paychecks, I'm I'll wear whatever number. Exactly, you I'll wear any number uh, that I can uh, just to be out there. You know, good. Well, Alex, I, I want to kind of dive into just sort of we, we're going to talk about Coach Heastan a little bit and just the, 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 you know, give your opinion and analysis of him. And just first of all, just from a big picture standpoint, obviously Coach Heastan recruited you, uh, coached you for four of your first five years. And then also your first, what, year and a half in the NFL, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what just overall, what was it like playing for, for Harry Heastan? I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the care and attention he puts into every single player uh, is really not like nothing I've ever been a part of. That's why I think he's the best. Uh, he's so good at developing a standard within the room, a standard of excellence, and literally everything you do. Um, his attention to detail, not just on the football field, uh, as we know, is like his technique, um, like all that stuff, but also off the field, being to class, being in the weight room 10 minutes early, going to meetings 10 minutes early, being on top of uh, your schoolwork, everything is consistently the same, and it's a high standard, the highest standard. He holds it so we know, like, so you can reach your potential. Um, just his ability to that process to put you through the process, tough at times. Like as we all know, like he, he's a tough coach, but he cares about you. He wants you to be the best that you can be, um, and he's going to drive you to reach that standard. I want to talk a little bit about that last part that you you mentioned. There's a couple things that you brought up that I want to get into. The yeah. first one is obviously, you know, we've joked, we've been at practices before, and he's a very colorful coach, <laughs> we'll say, to be nice, yeah. right? Uh, you're you're going to hear some words, and you're like, oh, that's a that's a combination of swear words I've never heard kind of put together like that before. <laughs> that's I learned something new. I mean, write that down. Use that one for later. You yeah. know, and and very, you know, gr- you know very, um, I, I think it – I'm trying to think of the word to use just a very, I mean, it's, he's an aggressive coach and I, and I don't mean that negatively just to, you know, trying to explain his style very loud yeah. in his, in his teaching. And, yeah. and you kind of talked about that, but what allows you to kind of see past that or embrace that yeah. or whatever the case may be to take lessons from that? For sure. Um, I mean, he, he, he has his technique, he has his coaching. He, he comes from Joe Moore. Um, so he's going to coach it the way that he wants it to, to be when, when in practice games the same way. And he's going to hold you to that high standard. Yeah, it gets colorful. He's going to, it's tough. Like he's going to be on you on the field. Um, but then he'll, if you don't see eye to eye on the field or you keep making the same mistake, he'll text you, say, hey, come see me. We'll go through in his office, office and make sure that you understand uh, exactly what he wants from you regarding technique, play style, um, maybe developing a better understanding of the game concepts. Um, so that right there is like a great example of, yeah, it can be tough at times, but you know, he cares. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's why you can look past all the colorful coaching that you talked about. <laughs> um, because you know, he cares, he's going to be on, he's going to be tough on you, but that's what I think you want from a coach, mm-hmm. um, to stay on you, to push you to be the best you can be. Uh, my thing is like, if, if he didn't care, he wouldn't be on. So uh, I'm, would love when he would yell hit him and he still cared he wanted you to be your best um and that's how you like that's how you get past it one of the things i wanted to ask you is <clears throat> notre dame's going to have a a somewhat young team next year yeah like jared patterson's going to be a fifth year senior but you know blake fisher's a rising sophomore joe waltz a rising sophomore uh there's some other younger guys like as you look back and you've kind of went from being a young player you actually came you you knew what you were getting into you know, I mean, you you yeah. chose to play for Coach Eastan. Is there some advice that you would have for the younger lineman who maybe didn't necessarily, I don't say, sign up to be coached by him? That because it's going to be a change. I mean, you played under both coaches. It's going to mm-hmm. be a change in style. Yeah. Uh, what would your advice be as someone who went through it in regards to making, as a from a player standpoint, making that adjustment to Coach Eastan? Um, my best advice for them would be understand what he wants from you understand where he's coming from like yeah it can be tough at times like you can get mad and get in your head like your college student you're 18 to 22 year olds being told i mean it's it's going to be completely different from from what they had before um in the best possible way uh so that they can understand where coach he stands coming from the message what he wants them to do so they they can be their absolute best um is my message to them 
Now, when you were going through it, is and you you talk about you know you you showed up in 2014. Your class with you and Q and Sam Mustafer kind of served as sort of the foundation of what was to come. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you had some good old lines with Zach and Chris, and but the yeah. O line you thing really took off from like 15 to 17. You know, I think two of the three years you guys had the best offensive line in college football, and yeah. and you know you kind of see the evolution. Is that when you were young? Was it different with Coach He standing when you were older, or did did was he able to kind of relate? Like obviously the standards the standard, right? That doesn't change yeah. if you're a freshman or fifth year senior. But was his approach? Could he like adjust to okay, you know, uh, Ron, you know, Ron, Nick's is veteran, Steve's a veteran, Ronnie's a veteran, but Alex and Q are red shirt freshmen. You know, mm-hmm. the standards are standard, but the way that he would kind of coach you guys or be able to bring up the younger guys was there any difference there, or was it just hey? Uh, it's just going to be the same with everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, he got on everyone, he, uh, but at the same time, like the older you got, the, like the further on in your career you got, you got to understand the standard more and more. Uh, so you understood the expectations that he had for you as a player on and off the field. Uh, so you got better at doing the things necessary to uphold that standard. We had great leadership. We were able to come in in 2014 and we had Zach Martin, Chris Watt, leading the way for Nick Martin, Ronnie Stanley leading the way for like all of us. Um, so throughout like those different eras of, of guys that understood the standard, they could just pass along to us um, super easily and we could just continue it. Um, he coached everyone hard. Um, but as, as you got further and further along, we understand, we understood the standard and expectations that he had for us better and better. We were able to reach those better and better. Notre Dame went through a bit of an evolution in line in how they played offensive line from the two years really before you and Q and those guys. Cause I know Q started at guard that year. You got some starts at guard that year, got some playing time at guard that year in 2015 as well. Yeah. But in 13 and 14, it was kind of a, you know, pass oriented, you know, offense. Right. And then 15, you kind of started to make that transition to being more of a team that could really be physical and run the ball. You yeah. know, what are the things that, that coach he stand did and, and, regards to not so much, you know, kind of going to get some specifics here. What are some things that you, he did as a coach to say, Hey, look, this is how you play physical football. Is it, is it a mindset thing? Is it a technical thing? Is it both? You know, yeah. what are those things that are going to be required? Oh, uh, we started every practice uh, with challenge drill, which is like 10, 15 yards, mono, mono, like defense really had to like, give maximum effort and you just had to drive them 10 to 15 yards we started out with a few of those every practice um to kind of like and like every drill we did was full speed defense we'd often have linemen going full speed trying to beat us like like simulate a game and at the end of practice after however long two hour practice we'd finish with mere dodge which is a drill in which one guy is the defense you got a it's a tough drill um but great finisher pass protection drill um So we made practice like he made practice so intense that when it came to game times, we were so um, like kind of uh, games were easy for us. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, Yeah, because we like we our bodies were so accustomed to the the hard drills, the the hard practices, um, the technique being pounded into us when we were um, like doing our plays, running our plays Mm -hmm. in practice. So that came to game time. Our bodies were so ready for it. Um, we had all that volume under our belts. We knew that uh, defenses couldn't hold up to us because of how hard we practiced and how hard we prepared. I want to I want to kind of get into something too, Alex, that I wanted to ask you about. And and I'm going to show a play here uh, from a Notre Dame play here that uh, is going to kind of illustrate that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to bring this up because I put a lot of work into putting this, this highlight video together. I'm just saying, I'm just gonna, oh, let's see. I want to yeah. go there and, and I want to actually have a technical conversation here. So this is, this is an, in, I believe an inside zone play that you guys had against USC. You're the yeah. right guard here. I want to uh-huh. talk about this because I want to talk about the importance of a hand play. And yeah. that's one of the things I think has been, this is my opinion, Alex, you do not have to comment on this. Okay. Yeah. I think that's yeah. been something that's been missing in the last few years is really having another same, how to use your hands effectively. And I want to watch this particular play because yeah. if you look at this, this play and you watch your right, how you use your right hand to really manipulate this defender to open up yeah. the cutback lane. Cause the inside zone, mm-hmm. the, the inside zone, a lot of people have to understand it's inside zone. This is an inside zone to the left. 
but inside yeah. zone is designed as a cut back run. The goal is to have mm -hmm. it cut back behind. And this is yeah. a particular play, but just talk, talk us through this play, what you saw, you know, what made you do what you did and then how that was something that was instilled into you from a coaching standpoint of the importance of being able to use your hands to manipulate things this way. Yeah. Well, we used to start ground up. Uh, so footwork, that first step, open up your hips so you can hit your aiming point, your target here. It'd be the armpit of the, uh, the tackle, the two I. So that first step puts me in position to get my head over and I'm, I come up a little short on the target. I hit him a little bit more square than, than I wanted to. Uh, but I, I, I sink my backside hand in here and, and drive what I hit. Uh, this was oftentimes a lot of what our challenge here was about. Like you may be messed up when you hit someone initially, like in a game, but you got to drive what you hit, run your feet and, and finish with, with your hands inside. Uh, here, I got that backside hand in uh, and I was able to move him just so Josh could cut off of that um, hole there. So we started to ground up when, uh, when it came to that. So you're talking about the importance of line play is you've got to, your feet and your hands have to work together. Right. I mean, yes. And if you're late with your hands and that guy gets into your chest and you, you're not going to be able to get your hands on them and move them. Right. I mean, if, yeah. if you're just if your body, if you're body blocking them and all of a sudden you're bringing your hands late, you're not going to. I mean, unless you're just a body, you know, I mean, the world's strongest man, Larry Allen, back in the day, you're not gonna be able to get your hands up and get on them. <laughs> so the importance of hand and feet. And then the other thing I want to point out, too, is this base. And you never lose your base. That's such an important yeah. part of this too. And I noticed that I know that was something that Coach Eastan worked on a lot. Sure. When we, oh, when, we when you when yeah you were, always were uh, here. Yeah. So the the next progression in that challenge drill is the defender makes an escape. So he'd be driving him, driving him. He hits five yards, then he makes an escape to the ball. Mm -hmm. um, there as well, like pad. My pad level could have been better. Uh, my acceleration on contact. Those are all things Coach Eastan uh, preaches. I just had to get you out there working against the cornerback there a little bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. and this is another one I kind of wanted to talk through. This is another area that I think there there needs to be some improvement at Notre Dame, and that is really being um, effective with working combo blocks, getting off to the second level effectively. Yeah. So uh -huh. I want to talk a little bit about this this play right here. What what is this concept? If you remember, do you do you remember what play this was? Um, is this just zone. Yeah, it just looks like inside zone. Uh, yeah, just from pistol yeah, though. Right. Okay. Yeah. So just talk um, us through kind of what you're seeing here. Obviously, this yeah. is now a zone play that's coming to you. So you're now technically the front side blocker yeah. here. So just talk us through so this one, Alex. Before practice, we would be out on the field sometimes 30, sometimes long in 30 minutes before, just working double teams, working uh, B box with the tackle. So guard will work with the tackle, give them different alignments. So we'll do like a three technique on my right shoulder, B box to the linebacker. We'll move them a little bit tighter, a little bit more playing the gap. Um, if he was a penetrator that week or a reader, um, we'd have the offensive lineman giving us the look, uh, give us those different looks. Um, same with the guard center. Then we'd go inside for our combination blocks. Full speed, uh, we'd have an offensive lineman playing the nose guard, three tech, giving us full effort because um, that's how it is in the game. So you want to practice that way. So when it comes to game time, we, we hammer double teams every practice uh, before uh, pre-practice, during practice. Um, here on the specific block, um, I think he's a, yeah, he's, he's a two eye here. So I'm, I'm the cover lineman. Um, so you got you and Sam are working. And, uh, yeah, you and Sam are working a combo here, right? I think we lost Alex there, so hopefully we'll get him back here in a second. But I, I'm enjoying this because I think you know. Here we go. All right. Oh, uh, it's my bad. Yeah. yeah no, no hard. worries. No worries. Let's get back to this. Um, so, like you, you and you and Sam are working the combo here, right? front side yes. and then you've got mm -hmm. Q and, and McGlinchey working that backside combo. Cause that's the thing I love about this play, Alex is you've got yeah. two combos working together to open mm -hmm. up this hole. Yes. So, and so you, you were talking about you and Sam's combo. What yeah. So seeing? Quentin and I both in this play, I mean, we basically we're the cover linemen. So we have to start the fight. We have to really set it up. So here, Mike and Sam can drive through uh, the three tech. So we set it up, they come in and clean it up. So we get that movement and then we, we were coach wait for the uh, path of the running back backside, a gap backside. It's going to cut back. 
Um, so me, especially on the front side, I can wait for him to get parallel to my shoulder to come off um, and block that linebacker. Uh, same with Quentin. Um, but we, 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 we hammer those double teams uh, in practice full speed every day to make sure that they look like this in the game. Because ideally you want this play to hit either here or here, depending on what the mic and the backside tackle do. So you guys are able to kind of work that and push that out, correct? Is that kind of what you're saying? Because you're not bouncing yeah, this play outside. You can you can come no. off that lake because you're not bouncing. You just can't allow the run through is basically yeah. the thing, right? Like you've got to pick that up. Okay. Yes. Okay. So lo love that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of this here in the future. So that'll yeah. be, that'll be uh yeah, that'll be a, a fun time. This is a different angle from it. So you can kind of see it real time. <clears throat> you know, this, this linebacker's coming, this linebacker's coming hard. I mean, this isn't like him. I mean, he's, he's coming on a stunt. This isn't like him yeah. reading, reacting. He's coming on a stunt. He's trying to hit that, which means you've yeah. got to really step kind of not step down so much, but you've got to step inside gap and then work uh -huh. outside gap over a stunting linebacker. That's not an easy thing to do, um, you know, especially against good teams, which USC was that year. You didn't, they didn't look like a good team against you guys, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it's a good football team that won 11 games that year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with that block where they're, they're running that backer through, um, yeah, I just got to keep that base that we talked about mm -hmm. to be able to get him to Sam without turning my shoulder so I can come back and get just something on that linebacker mm -hmm. uh, to keep him from making the play. Yeah. Well, Alex, I, I know you've got a lot of things to do. I know you were already working out today because, you know, you're still trying to get out there and and uh, and do what you do here with the Bears. Yeah. And so, you know, getting that workout in today, I appreciate you joining us. I wanted to ask you one other thing, yeah. uh, as, and this is kind of about Coach East and, you know, the, the recruiting process for you because you've got a very interesting story, which I, I, you know, your dad played at Notre Dame. Your dad, Joe, played at Notre Dame. You had yeah. two older brothers that went to play college football, one with the Michigan, one with the Penn State. So you mm -hmm. coming up, you've got all – you're getting kind of uh, uh, sort of pulled in all these different directions out of Montgomery Bell. What was being recruited by Harry Heastan like? What was his recruiting style with you? And what was the pitch uh, that was made if there was one that said, you know what, yeah, Notre Dame and playing for Harry Heastan is, is what I is what I need to do? Yeah. Uh, well, no, Notre Dame in general is, is super selective, especially with their linemen. Um, when I was coming out, I'm, I'm sure it's the same way. Like a lot of, a lot of kids would love to go there. Uh, so I know Notre Dame, Notre Dame was pretty selective with who they offered. Uh, so when I got the, when I got the scholarship offer there, I like really looked at it. And when I met coach, he stand, um, I mean, I loved him. He told me straight up, he goes, look, like I, I'm, I want you to be the best you can possibly be. Um, we have all this going to put you in the best position possible, uh, to have success, to make the NFL, uh, I mean, because that's the ultimate goal, like, obviously, of playing college football. Um, and I remember, like, his attention to detail. We would do camps uh, with the guys, the summer camps. Um, and he, he would take us and go watch film with us and then take us to the afternoon sessions and uh, have us work again and, like, see how we can improve just that quickly from one one meeting with them. Um, so all, all that combined just really um, – you couldn't go anywhere else. And then, obviously, five years later, you're obviously a multi-year – what, three-year starter at Notre Dame, correct? 16, 17, and 18, right? Three years. I mean, obviously, yeah. you had the yeah. injury. but And then, obviously, started also two games in 2017 – or 2015, right? Yeah. Um, yeah so, right. you – I'm trying to actually think about this. So, you were, what, three – two and one against USC in games you started, right? Because you started against them. Or did you come off – did you replace Q when he got hurt against USC? I can't remember. You know, you started um, against USC in 15, right? I started against USC, and yeah. then I think we beat him that – we beat him in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I loved about watching you guys in 15 and 17 is you guys were great finishers. It wasn't yeah. just about opening a hole. It was about, you know, once that – The standard. Um, so, at like, even in practice, finishing after the ball's thrown uh, 10 yards downfield – uh, following the ball here, running after him. I think uh, Nick Martin has a play against Boston College in the um, – they played in the, I think, Fenway Park mm -hmm. in that game where there was a fumble and Nick scrapping, following the play, running after the ball carrier, bear crawling the, the fumble to recover the fumble. Mm -hmm. um, and th th that's a great example of the standard that uh, we, we all set was that we're going to follow the ball. He's our ball carrier, our receiver is busting his ass. I don't know if you can throw around here. Uh, You're good. <laughs> to make to make yards uh, 
for us, we should be the when he finishes, when he finishes the play, when he gets tackled, uh, we should be the first. He should look up to us, helping him up, knowing we're there for him, we're following him. Uh, we've got he's got our back, we got his back. Uh, that was all part of the standard um, that we had set. All right, Alex, I'm going to leave you with this last comment. We have a comment from a fan, uh, and I just had to say this, and I'm going to definitely send this video to Joe after we're done talking. But uh, Liam Gaming says, Hi, Alex. I knew your dad in college. Very nice guy. You're way better looking than him. Must come from your mom. So I am definitely had to get that out. I'm definitely going to let Joe know that that was said during the show today. Yeah. But Alex, man, I really appreciate you joining us today, man. This was a pleasure. You know I love talking ball with you, and um, yeah. Just want to thank you for uh, for taking the time. I know you got a lot going on for taking the time to to uh, speak with us today and just kind of giving people an understanding of what it was like to play for Coach Eastad. So appreciate that very much. Brother. Yeah, man, I appreciate it a lot. Thanks for having me on. Yep. See, you, Alex. All right. So that is going to be it for today's show. So it looks like Vince has muted himself. He is no longer talking, apparently. Uh, so Vince, just kind of as we wrap up, just thoughts on uh, thoughts on the uh, you know just what kind of what Alex had to say. I mean, obviously a lot of things that you and I think and believe. It was nice to hear kind of from him just how it how it works. Yeah, no question about it. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, no, I, I I was riveted when you guys had the film on, and he was like going through how he went about his business and the technical aspect of everything. And um, we could I didn't only tell him we were going to do that, by the way. Well, it was great. And it was funny because yeah. he's like squinting because he's obviously on his phone, you know, trying to watch the video, but he was loving every second of it too. Yeah. We can only hope that that is what we are yeah. going to see moving forward with Harry. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, the, the level of play that is expected, right. I think is the biggest takeaway. And it's the listen to what he said, you know, what he's right. saying, not the way he's saying right. it. That whole thing, I, I think, is super important for these young yeah. guys to understand. All of that is just music to my ears. Yeah. I mean, it was, that was awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a couple awesome. super chats that I forgot to get to before we get yeah, out of let's here. Let's do that. Let's do uh, that. Coach Vic 574, how does the QB skill set impact who Harry Heastan plays? I, I don't think it really does, to be honest with you. I, I think that. Like they didn't play certain guys in 2017 because Brandon Wimbush was the quarterback. It right, was right. these are our guys. We have to be good at run blocking and pass blocking, and so that's who's going to play. I think the only way that you would see who's a quarterback impact the, the who he plays is if it changes the 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 offense. If you're going to run a lot more movement blocks, you may say, "Hey, this guy's not a great movement block guy, right? This guy's not good on as a puller and." And this guy's not good in space. And we run a ton of counter and a, a ton of buck sweeps and a ton of G scheme, you know, a lot of screens. And, you know, it may impact it there. But I don't sure. think that's a quarterback thing directly. It's more about the system that's being implemented right. fits a certain type of player. Right. Uh, but the other thing, too, is, Coach Vic, I think, I think the one thing I would say, however, is what it could impact is who plays where. And so if, if you're coaching that 2017 team and, and you're a, a team that maybe runs the ball a lot more than you throw it, you may say, hey, look, we need our guards to be elite. So I may move Alex Bars inside to guard and have younger guys at tackle because that's the makeup of our team. Whereas right. if you were going to be a team that was going to throw it a lot more in 2017, you may have moved Kramer inside and Hainsey inside and had Alex still playing tackle. You know, because he at that time was a better pass blocker than the younger guys because uh, Kramer was a redshirt freshman and, and Hainsey was a freshman. Right. So I think where guys line up may be impacted more so than who plays. Because, yeah, because, again, it's it, he's going to find his top five. And right. he's going to tell Tommy, like, look, these are the best five that we have. Right. And this is what we're going to go to war with. And right. you need to make that work behind right. us. It, you, it yeah. may alter if Blake Fisher's right. a left tackle or right tackle. Right. You right. know, things like that. You know, if, if you're more of a run-oriented team or a pass-oriented team. Kind of and things. all that fun stuff. Right. If you're right. more of a run-oriented team, you may you may be, you may may be want to put Blake at left and kind of, you know, if you're more of a pass-oriented team, you may be better off putting him at right. I mean, just a lot of those things kind of can be factored. And we are going to have a show coming up here next week. We're going to talk about Blake Fisher because I think there's a lot of discussion and debate about where should he play and, and you know, just, oh, just throw him at left tackle like it's not even a discussion. So we're going to kind of dive into why it should be a discussion. <laughs> yeah. And it's not about someone being better than him. It's more about where can you move your best player, in my opinion, your most talented player, to make sure that your five 
is as good as it can be. And it's not always as easy just plugging him at one spot. Right. Mm-hmm. So we'll dive into that. Toe Jam 1992 says, what's the coaching term when the players look mechanical, lost in thought and not flying around? Like our O-line pre-Virginia Tech and our defense in the second half of the Fiesta Bowl, how does Harry Heastan fix with? I think you use the word. I think mechanical is the – you could say exactly. robotic, yeah. um, you know, guys that are just thinking more than reacting. Paralysis right? by analysis yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 And I think the way you fix it is just re- – and Alex talked about this. It's repetition. Yep. It's being it's repetition with the correct technique. And what what that does, Toe Jam, it's not just, oh, you get a lot of reps and you're going to be great at it. Reps breed confidence. Confidence breeds success, right? And you re- rep something so much that you're like, it's just second. Oh, yeah, inside zone. Okay, we, we know how to block this. It doesn't matter what you line up in. We know how to block it. We're good, right? And it's you're confident. And you say, hey, look, I know what I'm doing. I know how I'm supposed to do it. Like right. Alec talked about, Alex talked about on that inside zone play. His first step actually got him on the wrong aiming point, but he immediately knew what to do to recover. And that was bring that outside hand and bring that guy back where you wanted him, right? Like that, that's not thinking, that's reacting. And you're only reacting that way because you've repped that a million times and you know exactly, exactly. how to handle it. And you've made that mistake before. I guarantee you, Alex had made that mistake before in practice. And yep. and where he didn't quite, he said, I went a little too square on the guy. He should have attacked that upfield. He said, you know, the, the near armpit of that guy, he went more right down I, the I middle. The way he, I love the way he was talking about that. It's like, yeah, I messed up here. But right. just because you mess up on your initial blow doesn't mean you can't recover. And, and that I, was the thing. Like his base yeah. and his hands helped him recover right. from that initial aiming point. And those right. are the, th- but that all is part of the repetition. So it's about repetition, repetition, breeding confidence in what you're doing, confidence in the scheme. And then when you're co- – it's like this. I, I like to use this example, Toe Jam. If you're driving down the road in a in a, in a farm, you know, like a, out in the country, and it's pitch black and there's like no – there's no street lights, and you've never been in that area before, you're going to be probably be driving slow, like looking around, where am I going, right? right? But if it's your home – and you're, you drive that route from home from work every day, you're going to drive with more confidence, even though it's the same conditions, right? It's like, you know, if you walk into, if I were to go to Vince's house and it's pitch black out there, I would be stumbling around, not knowing where I'm going. If I walk into my house and it's pitch black, I know exactly where I'm going, even though I can't really see. Right. Right. Exactly. Because it's about repetition. It's about, you know, where you are, you know what you're doing, you know how to react to every circumstance. And that's what he said. As I loved hearing him say that because we talk about that. Like Saturday, and he, it's like he didn't want to say it because he felt like it would be disrespectful of opponents, but that's not what he meant. Saturday was the easy part. Exactly. You we know? talk about that and, in the first part of the show today, right? right? I mean, right. It, it's practice should be harder than the games. It, right. It's the way it should be. And he, he talked about how there were drills that they would do that were really hard, mm-hmm. and they would go hard for two hours against the, the first-team yeah. defense. And then yeah. they would have a drill after practice. You know and I mean? that fits in so well with what we're hearing from the Notre Dame players about Marcus Freeman's mentality, right? It's which is immediately get out there and compete. Yes. And I love hearing that that's already what, what Harry did. Like, it, that, like that's going to fit really well. And I think yes. Marcus Freeman's going to love – I I don't think Marcus Freeman realizes what he has yet with Harry Heaston. Like, I think he knows. I mean, he's a college football coach. He knows sure, that Harry sure, Heaston is sure. considered a legend and all that kind of stuff. But you don't really know what you've got until you get out there and you're like, okay, my D-line has got to bring it today. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to make Jason Adamiola so much better. Yes, exactly It's going to make right. Isaiah Foskey so much better. It's going to make Riley Mills and Jacob. It's going to make all these kids better players because they have to go against that every day. And 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 that's what I love. I mean, you'd watch we'd watch practice and Quentin Nelson and Bars and McClinchy, they're acting like it's a I mean, they're fighting like it's a game. You know what I mean? Like, cause that's the standard that he talked about that Coach Eastan set. And and I thought that was just um um really, really, really good, really good explanation of kind of what it Absolutely. what it is like, you know. A, a couple more super chats. Uh, Coach Vic five seven four. What D line worries us the most next season? It's a little too. I honestly, I'll be honest. I have not do- dove into uh, really the the opponent schedules to that degree. You know, so I, I haven't been able to look at who's got coming back. I would say off the top of my head, 
it's there's there's three. Clemson has could have the best defensive line in football coming back next year. They got Brian Breezy coming back, Miles Murphy's coming back. Uh, they're gonna have some really good players in the D line. Ohio State has a lot of talent on the D line, and if they can get that talent to play to its potential, then they concern you a lot too. Yeah. And then on the flip side is BYU, who doesn't have an overly talented defensive line, but you're gonna have a bunch of 24. 24- you know, year old dudes on that D line and they play hard. That is a physical, yeah. oh, tough yeah. football team. Yeah. Yep. So that part of it is kind of where, you know, you can it, concerned about it, but Clemson and number one, Ohio state, number two are definitely the, the defensive lines that, that concern me the most uh, for next season. There, there's, there's no doubt about that. It's a good question. Well, and we'll, we'll dive more into that stuff over the summer Absolutely. and Absolutely. I may change my mind. I may like study Cal and be like, wow, I didn't realize Cal had the D line yet. I don't know a lot about Cal. Right. So I, I, you know, but just of what I know, those are the three that that kind of concerned me the most. And then we'll wrap it up here with Garen. Uh, This is a great one. Uh, Guest was money. Now take mine. Great show. We will (laughs) gladly do so. We appreciate that, Garen, uh, for both of your super chats. Um, But yeah, I uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, I like this comment. I do want to leave with this one, actually. Uh, I've asked this before, but I felt that the D-line overmatching the O-line the last few years has stunted the development of the offense. Where have you uh, – where you, where now you have Harry He stand to properly utilize that challenge? And I, I want to explain what he means by that, and I think it's a great point. The D-line, especially this year, uh, you know, in 2021, is consistently whooped the offense in practice. Oh, my gosh. We, we've like, it's not it. close. Like, and so the offense it, couldn't even yeah. run a play at times. Right. Yeah. And it, that can hurt your development. I mean, yeah. It does. And there's no, that's the defensive line's not the defense isn't doing anything wrong. It's not their job. Their job's to play, and it's your job to stop right, them. Right. I, I do. I do think that because I think it was the defense made the offense better. I don't think the offense made the defense a whole lot better. Agreed. And it's offensive line and receiver because they didn't know how to play at receiver. Right. And they didn't have the Miles Boykin and Chase Claypool who was just physically so good you had to worry about them. So I think those two things are going to have a big impact on the defense. And I, and I, and I love the point that Spartan B88 is making here is the, the offense was stunted a little bit, yeah. you know, skill development because of the offense. Like, cause you develop bad habits. And we saw this from Logan Diggs in the bowl game. And people are like, why is he dancing so much? Because that's what he has to normally do when he gets the football. He, he he's not dancing by choice. He was dancing because he had to. And then when that becomes sort of your norm, you do that even when you're not. When you don't need it. it's like I've said about quarterbacks. Like people say, well, when do you know a quarter when the defense has gotten in the quarterback's head? When the quarterback's throwing like he's getting pressured, even when he's not getting pressured, because you've been hit so much and pressured yeah. so much, you're anticipating it. Right. And we saw that from the running backs. Like Kyron at times would kind of dance too much, and you're like, but I understand why, because he's had to do because it's not just games that that's happening. That's happening on Tuesday. That's happening on Wednesday. That's happening on Thursday. And you develop bad habits as a as a skill player, understandable bad habits, necessary bad habits. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. And that's not necessarily going to have to be the case. So, uh, great question, great way to end it, and I think that's just a really good way to answer the show. So, I appreciate Alex Bars being on the show today. Uh, he is great, uh, just a great kid. Love Alex very much. When my wife got sick with COVID, he was one of the first people that reached out saying, "Hey, you know, whatever you need, you know, just let her know." Uh, thinking about her and all that kind of stuff. Really, really good young man. So I wish him all the best and love talking ball with him. So, uh, and he yeah. is better looking than his dad. I'm going to have to call Joe afterwards and let him know that. But uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining us. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Hey, just read it. Hit the bell and share. Join us tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow at 1234, our Friday free for all mailbag. So, Vince, thanks for joining me today. Everybody, thanks for watching, and we will talk to you again soon. Sign up for the message boards, check it out, breakdown.com. And as always, thank you so much for watching the Irish Breakdown Podcast.